All right, so I'm Bronco, and I'm going to talk about uh, sensors and data and water um, and something about windshield wipers, because I saw that in the title, so I figured I'd throw it in. Um, OK, so I think talk, I'm talking about water, I always try to start with the most cliche picture I think most of us are familiar with. This is like known as the hydrologic cycle. But it basically you know, is this thing that they learn in elementary school right now. Water goes up and comes back down and swirls around, and eventually you know, is part of, becomes part of our lives. The thing that I really wanted to do once I came to the University of Michigan, which was about six years ago, is kind of focus on the urban component of the water cycle. Um, so specifically where people live. And that turns out it's fairly kind of complicated once you start looking into it because most urban systems, most cities, it doesn't matter how big they are, um, even small towns are underpinned by hundreds of miles of linear infrastructure for conveying water. Um, and the kind of water I'm going to talk about today, there's many different kinds of water, is storm water. And this is kind of how I pictorially represent it. So when it rains onto our roads and parking lots and other things, we don't like to look at it. We don't like puddles. So we try to get it out. We get it to go somewhere. And your most uh, probably intimate connection with this is probably the gutter on your street. Um, we kind of just look at these things, we walk by and we're like, ew, like what is that? <laughs> well, it serves a vital purpose because it feeds into a network of a variety, large system basically. Um, that water basically leaves that puddle um, and eventually enters a system of pipes and canals that progressively get bigger and bigger and ultimately convey a ton of water down to receiving systems, whether they're lakes or streams or rivers, et cetera. And you can see what kind of damage that water um, can do. Um, and these systems are actually doing what we designed them to do. Like many decades ago, we said, we don't want the water in the city. Get it out as fast as possible. And you know, we can look back at that and say the engineers of the past have done a pretty phenomenal job at doing this. So here's a picture of the LA Aqueduct. You might recognize it from some pretty fun movies. I tossed the uh, screenshot in there. Um, but basically, when it rains in the city of Los Angeles, 10 billion gallons of water get flushed out of the city within an hour and a half. Okay, and that ends up in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, I would argue that's a pretty successful thing if we told them to build exactly this system, but now we look at it and go, oh, it'd be pretty cool to have this water actually instead of flushing it all out in one hour. Um, so it's pretty tricky to modify the system because it's fairly expensive and fairly large. So while some parts of the country are struggling with basically uh, access to water, some other ones are just overwhelmed by it. So this is a picture from Des Moines that I kind of found uh, in one of the newspapers. This person just kind of casually staring into this uh, massive flood uh, I always tell students, don't do that. That's actually really, really dangerous. Um, when I moved to Michigan, this was actually quite prevalent. So this is 2014, a uh, fairly large storm event that hit the city of Detroit. And here we see some flash flooding. It turns out that flooding is the leading cause of natural disaster fatalities in the US. OK, so when we look at that. And it's not this kind of raging flooding that I was showing about earlier. It's actually this kind of innocuous looking flooding that we see under this highway overpass, where water piles up underneath the bridge. And people kind of misjudge how much water there is. And they think, oh, I can drive through that. And they basically get in with the car. The car bobs up. It's buoyant, flips over, and that's that. And that's how most people pass. It's really kind of preventable um, and very unfortunate. Now, it turns out that flooding is not just something that damages buildings and bridges in our cities, but actually has pretty dire environmental consequences. So this is a coal ash pile that I found in the city of Detroit. This is just a photo um, showing you that when it rains and when it floods, in particular, stuff mixes in with that flood water. So that's a picture of coal. But um, Hurricane uh, Florence was right the most recent one. This is actually pictures of massive factory farms that get overwhelmed. And all that factory waste and frankly, dead pigs. So that, there's actually 3.4 million dead pigs through Florence. Okay? And that stuff is mixing in the water. So while we're all trying to figure out how to save our cities from the flooding, one thing that we never have time to pay attention to is like what's in that water when it actually washes off. Um, so that's just regular old flooding washing stuff off. In the Midwest and a bunch of large cities, um, um, in particular, the older cities also have combined sewer systems. So storm water, the stuff that washes off, mixes with the stuff that's in your toilets. And if that system is overwhelmed, like in the case of Lake Michigan over here, it basically overflows and goes into the lakes and rivers. Um, and that poop basically has a lot of nutrients that feed lots of life uh, inside our lakes and oceans. And that life often takes the form of harmful algae, which basically start consuming those nutrients and give us the kind of picture that when you go into Google and you type Lake Erie into the search box, it gives you pictures of this. It doesn't give you pictures of like beautiful Lake Erie, which is interesting. Or maybe my Google feed is just really messed up. But um, <laughs> anyway, if you want to see pictures of dead fish, just type Lake Erie um, into Google. But basically, OK, this is a big problem. Um, and we want to do something about it. So like, I want to frame the talk today about like how we approach this. And I want to show you how we kind of do it. And then what are some alternatives um, for addressing this problem? So we have this right here. Here's Lake 
Lake Erie, picture from the New York Times, um, from satellite. And uh, so this is what we have and this is what we want. And so what do we do as human beings? Well, we do something about it, right? We're gonna fix things, right? And I think we are in a room of people, I would, I would imagine you're here because you kind of think about fixing things and you care about the environment. But that's what we wanna do. We have it, we wanna do something, we wanna get to where we wanna go. Um, Big solutions require, you know, big, big, big problems require big solutions. So we basically say, like, this is a, ma a massive problem. Let's solve it with a massive solution. This is a tunnel in the city of Chicago. Basically what it does is it's a big hole in the ground. If you have flooding, if you have overflows, why don't we go to the source of the problem, dig a giant old hole out, and then it's going to capture all that water. So this hole costs $3 billion to build, okay? And it's so big that tourists actually go into it um, and take selfies, and then you can kind of see. Okay, so uh, that's great if you have $3 billion, but if you don't have $3 billion, what can you do? A lot of cities and municipalities are going towards more green solutions, and I imagine a lot of you might be familiar uh, with this here in this room, but if not, basically what we're saying is, let's replace all these paved surfaces that are just washing water off with more green things, right? Because what they're gonna do is they're gonna take that water, absorb it, and kind of like help buffer this flooding. And to kind of see conceptually how that would function, I'm just going to look at the regular old parking lot within really any city in the United States. So we have a parking lot. We're going to hit it with some rainfall. And now I'm going to show you the only plot that I'll show throughout this entire, uh, throughout this entire talk. So no numbers attached to it. What I'm going to plot is just what happens over time when it rains. And specifically, we're going to look at is the water level in that parking lot. So when it rains, the water level goes up, and then the water level goes down, right? This is called the hydrograph in technical terms, but it's really just the flow of water over time. And what we're saying is, these parking lots give us this massive spike that can cause flooding. Why don't we replace it with more green things? And so this is a movement, in particular now in urban areas, called green infrastructure. It's replacing the gray stuff, which already sounds bad if you say it that way. I don't actually feel that way about it. But replacing gray with green, because we're going to turn this big spike that causes flooding and all these water quality issues into this green thing that's basically better. Okay? Um, so great. We have something. We're going to do something about it, and everything's going to great. And that'd be great. So, what I'd like to do is just segue you real quick here and uh, go on to a tangent here called the dangers of doing. Um, and we're going to see like what could happen when we just try to do things. Because how could that be bad? Um, could it be bad, actually? Let's, let's pose it that way. So we're going to look at the state of Michigan. I included the top part because I get in trouble when I don't do that. But there's like two parts to Michigan. Um, and we're going to put our logo on there. So that's the University of Michigan. Um, this is our logo for the school. And the city of Ann Arbor is located right there. And even a city of Ann Arbor that's relatively affluent, I would argue, um, and has a good tax base, and I know that firsthand, um, uh, experiences issues of flooding. So no matter how much money you have, you have, you have issues. This is a picture from downtown. So what the city does, because they can't do a $3 billion tunnel, is they build lots of these green things and a lot of these storage assets. Think of them as little buckets throughout, throughout the city that capture that water. Um, oftentimes they look aesthetic, but they're actually there for stormwater management purposes. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at a watershed in the city that's about 10 square miles large. Uh, it's, it's basically, the area is, is about a quarter of the city, essentially, and all those flows basically start in the top portion of this watershed over here and kind of flow when it rains over into this outlet um, down here. Um, and so what the city did is it said, okay, we have all these water quality issues, we have all these flooding issues, let's start doing stuff about it. So, you know, like any other city in the United States, they start installing these practices, maybe things like ponds and basins, or most recently, this green infrastructure. And the idea is that when you put one over here and you put one over here and you put them everywhere, everything's gonna be good. Okay? So this is kind of where I'm leading to, which is this idea that uh, does good plus good equal good? Does just distributing these benefits give us overall benefits? Because that's what we want. We want overall benefits, right? And one way to study that is to look at a particular case of just two neighborhoods. So let's say I have neighborhood number one, neighborhood number two. And let's say we haven't built these things yet. So we go into that neighborhood, and now what I'm going to plot again is that flow of water over time. So here's my first neighborhood. It rains. Flow goes up, maybe it floods that neighborhood, so that's not good. Uh, flow number two, you know, the neighborhood drains a little bit later in this case, because it, it takes it a little bit longer to get downstream. And then they add up together downstream to give us some sort of behavior of flow. Okay. So now we say we don't like flooding in these neighborhoods, let's fix it. So we fix the neighborhood number one, good. We fix neighborhood number two, good. And now, without paying attention to what's happening at the system scale, now they're adding up to give us worse behavior than we had before. Okay. Uh, so not only, you know, going back to this question, I think there's always this thing about like, well, if we do good things, it's just good overall. Maybe, hopefully, I hope so, really. But not only can good plus good not be guaranteed that it's good, it could be worse. And we have many examples of where it can be worse. So I guess the, the, the caveat here, the word of warning is that I always like to pull out, before you do this, we really need to think at a larger scale. And before we jump into this aspect of doing, we need to think at a larger scale to make sure that the things that we're actually doing are accomplishing something. Okay, so how do we do that? Um, 
because we tend to basically just build stuff and leave it in for 50 years. Well, one of the first things we need to do is we need to measure stuff, okay? And I think this applies to any discipline. We were actually talking about this at dinner last night, right? That how do you know if the thing that you're doing is actually accomplishing something where you should measure it? And the thing I'll tell you today is beyond just measuring it, we should adapt. And we should adapt actually in a very fast way. Instead of adapting and waiting 20 years and then fixing something, why don't we fix it quicker? Probably the most tangible example I can think of for everybody in the room here, um, you already experience this at home. So here's the, you know, the IoT revolution or whatever, Internet of Things. I don't know, it's like CEO buzzwords basically. But the idea that uh, self-driving cars and smart homes are coming. And so this picture right here is like a smart thermostat. Okay, it's smart in like uh, little brackets here because I think that uh, implies that something else is dumb, but we'll just go with it. Um, what does it do? It sits there, it says, I want the house to be comfortable. It checks, are you home? Sells a little bit of your data. And then basically adjusts the temperature until, it's, uh, until it basically hits a sweet spot that you're comfortable with. So it measures and adapts until it hits this point. So uh, how is this relevant to, to water? Because we're working at really large scales. So about, uh, I'd say like four years ago, we kind of came up with this graphic that said, okay, in the age of the self-driving car, what do smart water systems look like? So now you can imagine a city that has the typical water infrastructure that it has, but we augment it. We add to it sensors that measure things like uh, rainfall, soil moisture, flows, water levels, really anything related to water that you might want to measure. But then you also do something about it in real time. So you adapt by controlling various things um, that I'll talk about in a second. So not only are we measuring, but we're actually doing something. So let's kind of step through it and see how we're approaching this. So here's our sequence, okay? So we have something, we want it to become better, we're gonna basically do something, but we're gonna measure it. So the first step of measurement, this is what we ran into, is recognizing that there's very limited data on water in the United States. And this is actually kind of a tricky problem. So our biggest source of water data, and the most reliable and the sort of gold standard is the USGS, US Geological Survey. We got anybody in here who works there? Just have to double check, okay, good. I like them, yeah? Okay, awesome. Like, I like it. I, I, I love the stuff that they do um, because they put out these really hardened stations you can see in like beautiful places. And what they do is they measure water level in rivers and streams and potentially flow. And when we look at the map of the United States, we see, wow, they measure water in a ton of places. That's really good. Um, well, that's 8,000 stations across the United States. And we could look at that and say 8,000 sounds like a lot, and, it, and maintaining 8,000 things around the U.S. is a pretty tricky job. But when we zoom in at the state level, and I'll just pick Michigan as an example again, you'll start seeing it becomes pretty sparse. There are counties in the United States that have no measurements of water, but we're doing stuff in them without knowing if it's something. We don't know what's happening, right? Um, so if you divvy out 3,000 counties with 8,000 gauges, you get anywhere between zero to three measurements of water uh, per county, okay? No matter how small the county, no matter like, you know, how little money it has, they're still investing millions and millions of dollars, in some cases, billions of dollars of infrastructure without measuring, which is kind of interesting, okay? So we wanted to use this data. It wasn't sufficient. We loved it, but we basically started augmenting it. We said, if we need to increase the number of measurements, well, how can we go about it? So the students in our lab are kind of trained in, in multiple ways. They're trained in water resources, and then they're trained oftentimes in electrical engineering and computer science. Uh, so they got a dual degree, but that allows them to build things like this. So what you see here is basically what we call our sensor node. It's a wireless device that's almost like your cell phone. You strip away the screen, and you just leave the little processor and the modem. And to that, we can connect any number of sensors. So in this case, we have rainfall, water level, soil moisture, water quality. Um, and we deploy these basically throughout a city. So each one of these is deployed. We might have like one per square mile, maybe multiple per square mile. Um, and then we can also hook up any number of controllers to it. Um, and this is all open source. So we created this project about four or five years ago, as I said, to open source all these technologies. So you can go on here and build these if you're interested. But this is what it looks like in the field. So this is two students deploying these water level gauges to supplement in places where we don't have uh, data. Um, this is what it looks like when they're in the field. So we work with, you know, it started off with just a bunch of grad students and myself, and then we did undergrads, and now we have high schoolers deploying these for us. So we've deployed like over 100 of these. I think we're 150, maybe more of these devices out there. Um, and basically, as soon as you deploy one of these water level sensors in this particular case, the data comes back in real time. So now you basically like, if you will, just turning on the lights. You know, this is an analogy that one of my uh, colleagues uses that works for one of these smart water companies. It's basically saying like, you know, you turn on the lights to see what's actually happening. So if you go to a website, I can show you this website later, all this data comes in in real time. Okay, so now we have a way to collect data. So that's step number one. If we don't have enough, we have to collect our own. And then we want to do something. Um, so this becomes kind of interesting. So if I want to control water, how should I do it? What, what device would you use? Any ideas? 
they've been around for like forever, hundreds, millennia, right? It's like a dam, a valve, something, right? So here's my, uh, here's my picture of a valve. Well, to control water, you just use a valve. Valves have been around forever, nothing magical about it. Um, where should you buy a valve? Where do you buy anything? Yeah. <laughs> this is how fancy research is conducted. You go to, to Amazon.com and you get it with two days, two day prime, um, free shipping, right? What we do is we take these valves, we attach to them things that move them up and down, and we control them through the internet. So basically show up, in this case, this is a five million gallon stormwater basin working with Washtenaw County and uh, in Michigan. I don't know how, why they allowed us to do this, but it's pretty awesome, I don't ask. Um, we basically put them in there, and now we can control the flow of that water. Um, let me actually uh, silence that real quick. Well, I guess it's not. But basically, these valves, when we put them in place, can now take a site that already exists and retrofit it. So let's take a, a really typical one that you probably see everywhere, or probably where you live. This is a treatment wetland that was installed by the city. It's basically, think of it as a bucket with a bunch of green stuff in it. And the way it works is water goes in and water goes out, just like those examples I was showing you earlier. And now what we do is we add one of these valves to it. And by adding that valve and connecting it to the internet and connecting it to a bunch of solar panels and batteries, we can control it remotely. We can close it so it looks like the thing on the right, or we can open it so it looks like the thing on the left. And we can throttle it to do what we want it to do. Now, there's immediately a number of benefits that come with this. By holding water and not releasing it, you're already helping something downstream, right? You're holding it in place. Another thing that's happening is all the solids and pollutants and other things that are in there are now exposed to these plants. And, and just a bunch of you who do ecosystem stuff in here probably know that plants are really good at treating a variety of different pollutants. So basically what we do, a really simple thing, it, it closes the valve, holds the water in there, lets it sit for about 24 hours, it filters out the water, captures the sediment, and then just slowly opens up. Or if it detects through a weather forecast that uh, something's coming through like a storm, it opens it up. Okay, so that's at the site scale. So now we can control infrastructure for uh, a very minimal investment. This is like a few thousand dollars, like three thousand dollars. Okay, whereas the site itself is probably many million to build. So where it becomes interesting is when you have many of these across the scale of an entire city. So this is kind of a conceptual example of before we installed control. So this is real-time control. So what I'm plotting is flow of water over time. We have those two neighborhoods we were looking at earlier. So neighborhood number one, neighborhood number two. They meet downstream and maybe they cause some sort of flooding. And now what we're saying is, if you add these valves that are connected, that are constantly coordinating with each other, what you're doing is you're allocating storage dynamically. You're basically saying, it's raining a lot in this part of the city, let's let that flow, and then over here we have extra storage, why don't we close that valve and actually hold it back, right? So in the case of this. And so what you're doing is you're basically shaping this flow of water to give you the downstream behavior that you want. Um, and it turns out a pretty precise level. So what we basically do with this is we deployed it all across the Great Lakes, uh, initially through the support of the Great Lakes Protection Fund, which is a, a foundation in the region that helped us build out a lot of this. Um, and now with continued th support through the National Science Foundation, in particular, the, their Smart and Communities, uh, Smart and Connected Communities, that's the program. You can see all our partners on here. The, the network I'll, I'll focus on is kind of our, our, our big test bed in Ann Arbor. So this is that same watershed I was showing you earlier. It's uh, 10 square miles. And we went in, and we didn't know how many measurements we needed, so we just took a ton. There's like 30 sensors for 10 square miles, which is a pretty crazy uh, density of sensing devices, measuring everything from water quality to flow to all these different things, and then basically also controlling the flow of that water. Um, and why that becomes interesting is because now we can dynamically control that whole entire watershed. So the image to evoke here is, think self-driving car, but for water. A thing that guides itself constantly to achieve some sort of end goal on a minute by minute, maybe second by second basis. Um, and to show you how it works at a system scale, I'm just going to focus on one of the sites. So this is that site I was showing you earlier. This is about 5 million gallons of stormwater. And what happens in this part of town, when it rains, all that water flows down. And it flows down actually into a really big investment that the city made. It's a treatment wetland. So this is one of those green solutions I was talking about earlier. What that treatment wetland's supposed to do is take the flows from here and all over, when it all runs off, and it's supposed to go through that wetland, through this little snake area. It treats that water biologically before it enters the river, right? We want to do a good thing. Now, um, what happens, unfortunately, a lot of times is that site is too small, so it overflows most of the time. So water comes down downhill, it basically overflows the basin, and you lose that treatment capacity, and you have flooding, as you can see in this picture. So we had a really simple example. We said, let's go ahead and put a valve on the site, okay? We're going to put a valve on that red dot, and then we're going to put a sensor on the wetland downstream, and we're only going to send water down when it actually has capacity, right? So like. Do you have capacity? Yes, okay, I'll send you some water. No, hold water. Very simple kind of concept, right? Um, the interesting thing about it is, even though it seems simple, it's 
two or three miles apart, and it's a bunch of students doing it. Again, like, I don't know who let us do it, but it's cool. <laughs> we're very lucky to have the, the partners that we do in the county and the city. So this is the experiment. This is the basin that we're controlling. This is uh, in December. Storm had passed. We're holding that water now. And then when we're ready, we release the water. So what, you, what I'm plotting here is the water level in that basin and then the subsequent water level in that wetland, um, showing the data. Okay. Um, also showing some, uh, some videos here, uh, just a background of why we have videos. When we showed our sensor readings originally, people were like, well, how do you know your sensor data is good, and is it as good as USGS, and how do you know this is even happening? And so we said, okay, fine, if we take videos, people will have to believe us, so that's why the videos are there. But basically, <laughs> but basically, the basin is draining down, very simple concept. You open a valve, the basin water levels go down, and then about an hour and a half later, they show up downstream. And so here's an image of that happening at the wetland. Um, so you can see at the wetland, water levels are changing between that red location and that green location. Um, and because it's not raining at this point, we know that the only thing causing that change is the control of these things through the internet. It's kind of interesting, okay, across many square miles. What does this actually boil down to? Like we look at the water quality impacts and the flooding impacts as a research group, um, which it turns out here basically by holding that water upstream and not flooding, now you have all this extra treatment capacity. You've basically made this downstream site way bigger than it was just on its own because you're basically sending that water in later. And we've quantified all these benefits to nutrients and you know, et cetera, but basically what it boiled down to is the city took the numbers and they did a bunch of, bunch of money calculations. And what they found out is that just by the addition of that valve, which again, it costs like $5,000 or so. I'm just counting the cost of the materials, not the students. Um, it saved the city about $1 million, okay? And how, how so? Well, because they can build smaller infrastructure now to deal with the same size events through the addition of these, uh, through these systems because they're basically actively controlling the watershed to achieve these benefits. Um, again, I stay away from the money calculations because I feel like that should be done by people who do that or not. Um, on a daily basis. So that was kind of a cool thing for our lab, and that really kind of launched us in this area. And so then I told the students, like, what do you guys want to do next? Like, that's a pretty cool, like, first experiment. Um, try to do something more interesting. So I walked in the lab one morning, and I saw this hydrograph. So this is actually a USGS gauge at the outlet of our watershed. So I was showing you that the watershed outlet is at the bottom, all the water flows through. And, and I saw they used the valves to, to do this. And I was figuring out what were they doing, and they actually spelled the Michigan M um, in the hydrograph. And there's probably somebody at USGS wondering, like, what is happening to the stream page? Um, okay, we're engineers. Like, we show what's feasible in this case. And there's probably a bunch of you in here who are like, okay, why would you spell letters? There's more meaningful things to do. Uh, absolutely. Which is why we need to talk to you and learn from you. The point I'm trying to make here is, instead of just implementing and hoping that something functions, you can measure very precisely uh, the outcomes that you're trying to achieve. And if you don't like what you have, you can go fix it. So you can spell an M or worse things, whatever you want to do. But the point is, um, it enables you a tool, it gives, it gives you a tool to enable large scale control of watersheds. And so what we do as a research group is we try to figure out, okay, from a research perspective, when we have cities now that have instead of two or three valves, hundreds of valves, thousands of valves, how do you coordinate that? So that's just a bunch of math. So if you look, actually, if you look at our website, all our papers are just a bunch of math. How do you convert like domain knowledge and water science into something that computers understand? So we can take the algorithms that are being made by you know, engineers for self-driving cars and all these other things to control um, watersheds. Okay, so that's our research. So continuing with this, that's like a 10 square mile watershed. I guess a natural question could be, does this scale? Can you do this at bigger, at bigger scales? And it turns out, um, it scales fairly well. So I'm gonna focus on the city of Detroit. We'll kind of zoom in and I'll show you a much bigger system. So this is the city of Detroit's combined sewer system. It is one of the largest in the world. Depending on the storm, it is the largest in the world and it's by far the largest in North America. Many hundreds of square miles of pipes and tubes and other things that flow ultimately to a big treatment plant. Um, before they get to the treatment plant, they flow through a number of facilities that involve pumps and gates and valves and other things that basically just get it downstream. And so the system is really, really large and that water flows along these main interceptor lines, as they're called, to um, essentially what is the largest treatment facility in North America. This treatment plant is massive. I mean, Detroit was built anticipating a really large population. The, the geographic extent is massive, and now we don't have the population to match the actual size of the infrastructure, which is an inter interesting problem. But basically, it leads to issues like this, right? So here's the Detroit River. You know, we, lo we love our Detroit River, but basically, it does, it does happen that, you know, we get these sewer overflows, which ultimately end up in Lake Erie. So we want to reduce that. So one way to reduce that is to build more infrastructure, or we kind of met with them and said, what if you 
take a look at your current system and see if you can squeeze more performance out of it. Because um, it turns out in Detroit, the Great Lakes Water Authority, who runs this thing, the utility, has hundreds of sensors in their system already. So we didn't need to deploy anything. They have hundreds of sensors measuring flow and all these different things, and they actually already have control points. But these control points are controlled manually. So it's an operator looking at the feeds, which if you have 100 feeds, that's a lot to look at, and they're kind of like trying to do their best judgment on when to turn things on and off. And one of the things they can turn on and off is this massive inflatable pillow that's inside like a 30-foot pipe. So you can see the sewer. It's 30 feet in diameter, and they basically press a button, and this thing inflates. I think this was actually made by one of the tire companies. Custom order, I can imagine, it's fairly expensive. But you can hold that water. When you hold this, all that water backs up uh, over there, and you basically can control it. And so what we did, and I'll spare the math, because this is basically a ton of math that went into it, we built a system for them that takes basically all this sensor data, quality controls it, and gives the operator suggestions about what to turn on and off. So instead of following your intuition, and actually their intuition is pretty good after you know, 20 or 30 years of operating, we try to give them little hints and tips of maybe what to do in this case. And so uh, the way I would summarize this project is we take a bunch of data and we convert it into information that's actually useful, right? Because they don't want to be looking at 100 data points. And the result that we got from this, at least from simulation, was pretty shocking. We found out that just by adapting real-time controls, the city could reduce 100 million gallons of raw, basically sewage, or combined sewer water flowing into the river. Uh, and that's great environmentally, like that's, that's good, and we just talked about why. But interestingly enough, they are looking at options to invest in the new infrastructure. Uh, you know, a la Chicago. Let's build a big thing downtown that captures that water. Well, it turns out if you wanted to build a 100 million gallon storage tank, that would cost you $500 million, okay? Uh, the investment they made into our project was like $100,000, just to reoperate. Think about reprogramming a water system, which is a really strange concept, but you can do that. Um, this was done by a bunch of students in one year, and they ended up submitting their, uh, they ended up submitting this to a contest nationally, just to see what happens, I guess. And I'm really happy they were included in the official contest and not like kicked over to the student section, because they ended up winning the grand prize with this one. And I was like super proud of them, because they basically showed how you can use data um, Streaming data to basically improve these systems, benefit the environment, and save money, right? So it's like this triple bottom whatever thing, right? So um, if you can see, I don't come from that background. I don't know what to call it. Um, but anyway, so that does scale to larger systems, and it turns out it actually scales more. So this is a much larger watershed. Ann Arbor is sort of smack in the middle right here. We were doing all our experiments over here. This is the Huron River watershed. It has 17 dams and reservoirs that are being regulated and controlled, um, and they only have three or four measurements. So just the math alone on that, like how do you control a whole river basin with three measurements if you have like almost 20 control points? So what we've been doing with them is deploying these sensors along the river basin to give reservoir operators basically a decision-making tool to control the river. And that's actually hugely beneficial to flooding, but also really beneficial to fish, it turns out, because we have spawning season where the fish are basically coming in from the bottom. And if those reservoirs release suddenly, or you know, two reservoirs release at once without coordinating, you flush out all that fish habitat. Right? So there's all these benefits of basically trying to say, let's use data to try to make sure that we're achieving these end benefits um, that we're looking to do. Um, and so that basically leaves us off with where we are right now. So our group right now, which is very lean, very small, like we have you know, a few PhD students, but mostly undergrads and high schoolers deploying this. At the end of the summer, we're going to have most of Southeast Michigan covered in sensors. And our hope is that basically by doing so, we're going to sort of create a, a template for what water information systems could look like. You know, what's the, what's the next version of it and how can it actually be used for real-time um, decision-making? So that's, that's real-time controls, that's, that's data collection. Um, it turns out that oftentimes you can't deploy all the sensors you want, okay? So I would love to go out and deploy 1,000 sensors to measure water level, but we're always gonna miss data. So what can you do when you don't have uh, uh, the data you want, right? Like, what can, where else can you look? And one of the big challenges for us has actually been rainfall. So just like stream gauging in the United States, which is done by the USGS, as I said, we also have issues with rainfall. The number of rain gauges that are measuring rainfall are scaled down. And because, because they're disappearing, basically, I mean, they're still a big infrastructure, but they're decreasing in size, um, how do we know what's even going into our water systems? And so this is where the idea came about. My friend Ram, so here's a picture of Ram, went to grad school together, and he also became a professor, so this kind of worked out cool. He works on uh, self-driving cars. And I remember I was talking to him one day, and I was like, Ram, you guys are collecting a ton of info on not just the self-driving vehicles, but there's like 150 cars driving around Ann Arbor that are collecting a ton of data on all the various things that are uh, basically connected to them. And I asked Ram, by any chance, is one of the things that you're measuring rainfall? So this is the, the only GIF I could find of a uh, <laughs> windshield wiper. So this is what, 
Uh, a wiper can be comical, it turns out, right? Um, but anyway, uh, I was like, Ram, is there any chance that you guys are measuring windshield wipers? Because if you're measuring windshield wipers, we may be, use, be able to use them sort of as a placeholder, as a proxy for rainfall in places where we don't have data. And he said, absolutely. Not only are we measuring it, but for some reason they're measuring it at millisecond resolution and storing all the data. So here's, so here's, here's one of the cars driving through Ann Arbor, um, anonymized. Uh, and so basically it's driving through Ann Arbor and you can see the windshield wiper moving and you can see the raindrops moving. So immediately we know that there's a really good correlation between uh, wiper data and the raindrops. The question is how does it relate to the gauging networks that we have? And this is where things just blew up on us. Because we thought, what's gonna happen when a car drives to the city is it's gonna drive by a rain gauge and when it's next to the rain gauge, they're gonna be perfectly agree agreeable, right? The rain gauge is gonna match the car. Or if we're driving around and cars driving into like a radar field, like the one that's mapped over here, they're gonna agree. Basically what he found out is that a lot of things disagree and we almost don't know anything about rainfall. At least I say that as somebody who doesn't understand meteorology that well, but it was extremely frustrating um, to discover this. So we basically worked on these algorithms that would try to take all these various data sources, rain gauges, radar, and then these wiper data to try to fuse them together into some sort of product. And the end result is this. We created something that would take radar data, which you see on the top. So this is the stuff that you see on your news feed when you watch local news. And what you see on the bottom is a car driving around. So those are those little trajectories. We overlay those two now to come up with an updated map of rainfall. And this is what it looks like. So there's two different storms I'm showing here. So the storms are one storm on the left side, one storm on the right side. The top part is the original radar data, the stuff we see in the news and we just assume is true. And then on the bottom is the car updated radar. And where that becomes really interesting is when you can, for example, compare the one on the right over here. So this is what we thought was happening, and this is what we think now with the cars. We're detecting rain in places where we didn't think it was happening. And that's a pretty big deal, because as you saw, it influences flooding, it influences water quality, it influences how we design infrastructure. Because a lot of engineers that design our infrastructure assume that the measurements they're getting are, are, like, are representative of what's actually happening. And what this is showing us is that you've got to be kind of careful. Um, and what it also showed us is that when you don't have the resources to deploy everything you want to have out there, maybe you can rely on things that already exist. So sometimes data sets that are not obviously like, made for your application can become, you know, can be made malleable to apply to the things you care about. So anyway, it's, it was kind of an interesting study in discovering value in things that seem to have nothing to do with each other. Okay. So um, in, in kind of closing here, we talked about this. The, the, the thing I want to emphasize is that I think we all have the same goal. We want to improve our environments. We want to reduce flooding. Um, and we want to do that by, by you know, putting shovel in the ground and basically doing something about it, right? The thing that we have to be careful about, though, is that ecosystems have to be studied as actual systems. Oftentimes, we like to study individual things. And so by, by looking at the individual and how it performs on a larger scale of watersheds or the broader system, we're gonna be able to hopefully achieve that. And in the meantime, technology is not the solution. I'm not here to say like smart water systems or whatever you know, tag gets applied to it is the solution to this. It's one way to look at the problem. It's a way to actually build this feedback loop that exists in many other things like your thermostat and your car and all these other things to basically measure what we do and change it um, to get the outcome that we actually wanna have. And so with that in mind, I'll show you all the pictures of the students that uh, worked on this, along with obviously acknowledgement to many of the funders that funded us in times when we thought these ideas were kind of weird. Um, but basically, there's my contact info. Unfortunately, I'm out of cards. But if you go to openstorm.org, it has, this is our open source web portal that gives all of this out for free. We also have you know, tons of workshops and stuff if you're interested. But basically, this website will have everything you saw here, plus the detailed plans in case you want to put one in your backyard. So um, thanks. Thank you very much, Franco. That was fascinating. Sure. Um, so, hi, everyone. I'm Sunshine Menezes, Executive Director of Metcalf Institute. And um, I just want to remind everyone that we are recording this for our media partner, the Publix Radio. So, um, Sean and Beatrice are walking around with microphones. Just raise your hand and please speak directly into the mic. Thank you very much. This was fascinating. Thank you. Uh, I'm wondering, those, those uh, storage areas, the screen storage areas, while they're filtering all this stuff out, yeah. do they eventually turn into brown fields? Yeah, that's a really good question. <laughs> so um, what is the long-term consequence of implementing these green distributed solutions, right? Because we're saying instead of digging a big hole, now we're going to have hundreds of distributed things. They're going to capture all this runoff and possibly concentrate it in it, right? 
they haven't been deployed for long enough for me to at least know like what, what that long-term impact is. I think that discussion is being had in like academic circles and a bunch of cities that have now had it are looking into it. But yeah, if you capture stuff, it stays there now. Could it turn into a brownfield? I don't know, you know, that's a specific designation. But yeah, that's something we need, to, we need to account for. So the way I guess I would speak to that is that when you deploy a bunch of distributed solutions, they require maintenance and they require us to keep an eye on it, which is where measurement and, and monitoring becomes even more important to do that. So it's, it's a valid concern. I don't, I'm not aware of any particular data on it, but it seems pretty intuitive, right? So. Again, I thank you there for a really interesting talk with lots of good Thanks. things to think about. Um, I have a question that um, I know that for um, at least along the Atlantic coast, there's a citizen scientist monitoring program called COCORAZ, yeah. which measures rainfall. Do you have that in Michigan? And is that something you can use? Uh, so, so the question is about citizen science, I guess, in general. And there's a specific program that you mentioned along the coast. Um, I'm aware of some citizen science programs where we are, not one particular to rainfall. That would be kind of cool, and I'll have to look up the one that you mentioned to me. Um, but yeah, the watersheds we work in do get a lot of help from volunteers. In fact, that's what we've been working on, too. I didn't have a chance to talk about it here, but we build technology tools to, to sort of like help streamline the volunteering. So like volunteers can do now more sophisticated tasks um, using these technologies and stuff like that. But absolutely. So I'll, I'll look at that one, but I think the role of citizen science is not only important to help us get more data, but it also serves a really good role in terms of education, so. So while these uh, distributed systems can create some wonderful solutions, yeah. if you have failures in them, they yeah. can cause real problems and sort of localized flooding. So yeah. can you speak to the, maybe the robustness of the system? Have you had you know examples where you have gate, you know, the, the gates fail? Because the idea is, an open system remains open in, in, if you don't have a gate, but if you put one in and it fails, it can cause localized flooding. Thanks. Yeah, so, so the question is, uh, you know, I guess if I can rephrase, any, any solution that you propose has drawbacks, right? And you just identified one, which is to say, if you rely on technology and one of these gates were to lock up, something could happen, right? Um, I could even extend that and actually introduce something just to, just to expose myself here. What about cybersecurity and some of these other issues that, that uh, go around to it? Any solution is going to have pros and cons. The first thing I'll say is when you say the system stays open um, for like a system that's not controlled, uh, that's somehow true, but a lot of these systems get clogged, right? These things get, because we just show up and put a valve on something that's the same size that it already was. So whatever's going to clog the valve could have clogged the thing to begin with. Um, the interesting thing in that case is you don't know what's happening. Right? So one of the first things I always tell people is, even though you assume risk when you install something like this, knowing what's happening is your first benefit, because you can immediately send somebody out and make the fix. Now, the other part is, we have to take a number of precautions to make sure that these systems don't do more damage than you know, was, uh, was previously uh, possible. So we work primarily in locations where we have overflows. So if the, if the valve were to fail, we have a way to manually actuate it. We have basically a mechanism in the code that actually tries to turn it on in case something's wrong with the community communication and stuff like that. Um, we have overflows, but yeah, you're assuming risk uh, basically any time you do something. And so I think that lends sort of a broader discussion here, which is always kind of is interesting. This question always comes up. And the question is always like, I feel like uh, defending new ideas is tricky, but we never have to defend the old ideas. Right? So I'm always in a position, um, and, a very, and a very good, right? Like, we have to be skeptical of everything, and even I'm skeptical of my own stuff. I tend to take the approach of, like, let's find the faults in it before, before pitching the benefits. But you're absolutely right. There's drawbacks. We have to weigh the drawbacks against the benefits, right? So I would argue there's pros and cons there, but we should do the same thing with the established solutions, and we don't do that, right? Somehow we're always under the hook to show that the new things are, are dangerous, but it's like, what about the other one? It can already be flooding your city, and you don't even know it's happening, right? So I could rant about this forever, because it gets being like super excited, but that's a really good question and I acknowledge it and I'll just say, you know, let's argue more and debate it or something, right? It's good, thank you. Hi, Ricardo Sandoval, I'm on the Metcalf board. Great. And uh, my question goes to the scalability of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's wonderful, uh, I think, at this local level and in, 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 at a scale in which you can really kind of closely manage it. But I'm wondering if, as you grow it out, you're going to run into water sources where the controllers of the water source don't want you to know what's going on there yeah. and don't want you to know what's in the water. Um, how do you get around that when that data is so critical yeah. 
to the ultimate outcome of your project? It, it is tricky. So the notion of scalability, interestingly enough, when we look at scalability, saying like if we wanted to pull off something like this, when I look at it, I see that technology is not the challenge anymore. It, it was the challenge to try to get it to work, and now we know it works. But scaling out, going to larger areas, you run into all these social problems. In particular, because you know water doesn't respect political boundaries, for example. So you have many ownership boundaries. You have some uh, cities and counties that are more open to this than others. Some are risk averse. Some are open to trying to new things. But yeah, it's it becomes a really tricky thing. And we've been trying to study that right now um, with help of a number of uh, social science partners. Actually, the University of Michigan has got like a really great program in this. And. We're serving decision makers, we're serving homeowners, we're serving basically anybody we can find in the community to see what their perception of these systems is. Because they are going to experience their water systems in a very different way than they have now, right? And so, again, what are the pros and cons of all of that? But yeah, the social aspects and the political boundaries is something that we're, we're just scratching the surface of. I can't, I can't think of many examples of where this was even pulled off yet, but if you look at places like the West, you'll know things like water rights don't make it easy, right? So. Um, hi, I, I live in southwest Florida, cool. and we've got a big problem. It's uh, the Everglades, yeah. and yes. it's a mess. So my question is, have, have, any, have you or any of your students had any contact with those folks? Uh, and my second uh, comment is uh, maybe a plea. We need help. Yeah. Uh, no, that's a, that, that's a great question. I actually went to the University of Florida, so that's where my family lives and stuff. But, and I know there's issues. Um, and that's, that's true across many places around the US. We, ha we get a question like this a lot of times, like, have you guys looked at this region, or what could you do for this region? Um, we're kind of just a little research group. And one way of solving this for us was like, let's just open source it and give it to everybody and they'll take it. And that's not happening. So we just solved that problem. And in fact, we were just having this discussion. If you're gonna, if you're gonna commercialize things like this, who's gonna do it? What's gonna, what's gonna happen? It can't just be us. Um, so part of it is education, and that's what I wanna focus on. I wanna focus on my research and the teaching and getting these things out. But ultimately, we need engineers and municipalities uh, to kind of think beyond the tools that they think they only have available. So my hope is that the toolbox that they have right now is gonna be expanded, not replaced by smart technologies, but really just kind of appended to, um, to do that. And the way we do that is through like this. I travel around a lot, we talk about it a lot, but ultimately somebody's gonna have to do it. Um, so, you know, I don't know who that's gonna be, but if anybody wants to do it, just let me, just let me know. Um, so I'd be happy to like maybe after this talk about the specific case, but what I would tell you is that we're still in the early days of this. Um, that's not to say that it's not ready, but you know, there's a lot of minds to be changed. Like, I don't know, you guys are being very nice to me here. That's not, that's not common, you know? <laughs> well, like, because you just show up and you're like, oh, we're gonna put widgets everywhere and it's gonna be great. And people are like, you don't know how the real world works. And it's like, okay, but like, my job as an academic is to kind of push a little bit. <laughs> and I'm also protected, which is nice, so, um, yeah. Um, so, I think you talked a lot about um, maybe like one place upstream has a lot of water, but then so it communicates downstream and, and see if we can open that up. I was wondering um, how or if you guys have kind of scaled it up to maybe like, so I'm from Houston, so mm -hmm. Harvey is very um, kind of recent and, and um, so, are, th are these systems able to kind of scale up to citywide 40 inches in two days kind of thing? And yeah, uh, that's a great question. So I just unpack a couple of parts of it, which is, uh, let's start with your last part. Can this scale up to a 40 inch storm? Um, we can build anything with enough money, let's put it that way, right? So that's not the option. So any system is going to fail at some point, right? So 40 inches, is wild, right? But what we say with these systems is you can take what you have and for a cost, effect, you know, cost effective way, push the performance of that system. So if it could handle a 10 year storm, like one big one every 10 years, now we can handle you know, a 20 year storm, something slightly bigger. Maybe not a foreign storm, but anyway, we're pushing it. So every system is gonna have a breaking point, no matter if it's the regular old systems or the ones that we're working on. The thing that we're saying is we kind of push it. Um, going back to your question, which is really interesting, is like I've actually gotten the same question before from somebody who I think might have been from Houston, is how many valves do I need in Houston? And I took it as like, I need to quickly compute like how many valves, and then I thought, I actually don't know, and that makes it a really cool research question. So I can go back to the lab and figure out that answer, but we've simulated very large systems. We can go to the city scale and control 
just about anything in a computer and show you how great it is. But when you hit the, when you hit, you know, when you get out of the lab, you run into the kind of problems that you were talking about. There's political boundaries. There's people who don't want their systems measured, which is weird, right? But like, if you find something, would they have to do something about it, right? That's not true across the board, but sometimes that happens, right? So the social boundaries, I think, are the biggest challenge to the scalability, at least these days, as I think about it. But te from a technology perspective, we have that. So I would encourage you, if you want to check out the, the students' papers on this, they're simulating just massive systems, and it looks pretty cool. It's, it's exciting. Since you just brought up the social issues, yeah. For your research, did you have to go through a permitting process? And if you did, could you discuss that a little bit in those discussions? Yeah, so uh, questions about permitting. That's great. That's like the first time anybody's ever asked me that. It is the biggest pain <laughs> that I have. Um, OK, let's start with regular old permitting. Uh, hey, we want to put a sensor in this bridge. And some city's like, who are you? <laughs> and then, like, you need to fill out this permit. And then we got this one. We're doing a, a whole watershed right now, which is 800 square miles. The state is funding it. And they said, put 50 sensors out. And we're like, great. So we showed up. And we're like, the state says we should put 50 of them in. And they're like, OK, you have to do 50 permits. And we're like, we don't have money for that. We don't even know how to fill out a permit, like, honestly, right? <laughs> um, so that was, that was just really difficult, but, but you kind of grind away at people and you show that it's kind of worthwhile and they eventually end up giving you something that's more like one permit. Um, but anyway, uh, that's really difficult. Another part of it is just working with people and assuming risk. So through the university, we have this IRB process, which stands for Internal Review Board. It's basically something that makes sure that we're working out there ethically. Right? So if we're going to engage with homeowner, homeowners, just talking to them, I'm not even talking about installing sensors, which is what we also do, we have to make sure that we're transparent about the benefits, the risks, that we're kind of you know, making sure that all the checks and balances are in place. So we try our best to do that, but it's a very large chunk of our work. Right? Very little of it is assembling like sensors and having fun with them. We spend a lot of time grinding away on things that we never write papers on. Um, so yeah, I mean, most recently, we're actually getting ready to install water quality sensors in people's uh, houses. And you can imagine with all the stuff that's been happening in Michigan, like it's, a, it's an issue, right? And so like getting stuff into people's houses is a completely different beast, right? And so you have to be careful and you have to you know, watch what you're doing. So. One more Thanks for a really interesting talk. Uh, this week, the seminars have really been focused on, of course, water issues, and a lot of that has been uh, has surrounded climate change. And I'm wondering if you or your group has thought at all about how some of these systems will be adapted to some of the dangers, vulnerabilities, and challenges that we'll face with either increased storms, you could address that directly, or uh, sea level rise, for example. Yeah. Um, so. As engineers, or I guess I should speak for myself, as an engineer, when I look at like changes that we see, right, I can kind of get away with just focusing on the local uh, impacts that we see, meaning storms are getting more intense. We've seen that, right, undeniable. Um, sea levels are rising. They're going up, like it's measurable. Um, so we kind of focus on just solving those problems. I don't know, you know, our group, could we lend to the bigger discussion on climate change and some of these things that are going to reduce emissions and things like that? Maybe, but I shouldn't speak on that. That's not my, it's not my training or any of that. Like, we, we'd love to think that we contribute to that, but ultimately, on a day-to-day -day basis, we focus on engineering problems, which is kind of really good because it's kind of a bi bipartisan thing, right? Like water, like take Florida, you know, sea level rise is acknowledged readily as like an issue. It's not like we're pretending like it's not real or whatever, right? So we focus on those things and say, how are we going to prepare our city? to handle bigger storms, right? How are we going to reduce the floods that we have? Same with sea level. What kind of options should we be looking at? I mean, there's a lot of people talking about now uh, of, you know, e ecosystem-based solutions like natural seawalls and stuff like that. I think the Netherlands are like a phenomenal place to look at. I mean, they live underwater, basically, and they figured it out through a solution of sand dunes plus gates that open and close and all these different things. So. We, we do think about that, um, and I don't know specifically what our role is in it, but I guess my answer to your question would be like, we're just engineering away. <laughs> so 